Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So there's been some exciting updates to the digital SAT for both the math and reading section. Now today we're going to focus on the math section because there's been an update to practice uh, test number one, two, and three in Blue Book. And in this video, I'm going to be covering all those questions as well as the solutions. Now, first off, I want to give a big shout out to JW Math Tutoring, who actually went through the work of filtering through the questions and actually getting the screenshots, which I'll link his YouTube channel below. Make sure you check out his content as well as the original PDF with the questions. Um, but yeah, guys, let's get right into these questions. So this is very important because with these new type of unique questions, these are kind of the concepts that College Board might even test in towards the future for let's say the August administration or something like that. So let's get into the questions here. So question eight and 16 on practice test number one. Uh, I should probably mention that these are for the harder module two um, have been replaced. So basically this question says for the function f for each increase in the value of x by c where c is a positive constant, the value of f of x increases by a factor of 27 which of the following equivalent forms of the function displays one over c as a coefficient of x so this is really really weird wording but essentially what they're trying to get at is they're looking at one over c in relation to the coefficient of x so what they want is for x and c to be equal but still increase f of x by a factor of 27. so what this means is let's say if we're looking at option a one half the c which is under the one is a value of two and so what they want is they want x to be also equivalent to 2, but then scale the entire thing up by 27. So the first thing we want to note is what is the starting value? The starting value is 48. Now why? Because when x is 0, um, what happens is we get anything to the power of 0 equals 1. So 3 to the power of 0 is 1. 3 to the power of 3, 9 to the power of 0 is 1. So everything times uh, 1, so 48 times 1 is going to be 48. So that's our starting value, all right? So you want to scale up 48 by a factor of 27. So we just get 48 times 27 equals 1,296, all right? So now that we have this equation, what we can do is actually just set it equal to our standard form of all these equations. So we can do 1,296 is equivalent to 48 because they all have 48 in them. And let's put this equal to 3 to the power of x. So 3 to the power of something. And so now we can just solve for x. In our case, x here is going to be equal to 3. So what we know is for these equations, for them to be the right answer, what we need is for 48 to be multiplied by a value of 9. Now, not only does it have to meet that criteria, but the x as before with that relation to c also has to hold true. So let's just go through it and see which one works. So for a, we have 1 half times x. x has to be 2. So 1 half times 2 would be 1. And therefore, we get 3 to the power of 1. That's not 9, right? We're looking for 9 because we have 48 times 3 to the power of x, and we know x is 3. Let's look at b. So it's not a. b is 48 times 3 to the power of 3, 1 6 times x. So x here has to be 6 because uh, of that coefficient of c. And therefore, 6 times 1, 6 is going to be 1, right? So then we have 3 to the power of 3 to the power of 1. 3 to the power of 3 is going to give us 27, right? So 27 times 48 is indeed this factor. And so B is going to be our answer for that question. All right, moving on to the next question. Uh, ignore whatever's on the right side. This is for the very next problem. So this one says... For each real number r, which of the following points lies on the graph for each equation in the xy plane for the given system? So the first thing to note here is that these are the exact same lines, right? If I were to scale this up by, say, 5, I would have 5 times 2x is 10x, 5 times 3y is 15y, 5 times 7 is positive 35. And therefore, if I were to graph it, they would be the exact same line. It would be on top of each other. Um, and therefore, all we have to do with this problem is find a value of r which can be any real number and just have these coordinate points satisfy any one of these equations um so to do so let's just pick a random number for r let's make it five here to make it easy so five over five is one one plus seven is going to be eight so that's our x coordinate and then we have five over five that's negative one plus 35 is 34. and so now we can just plug these values in and see if we get the right answer so we have two times 
x, and we know x they give us is 8. So you have 16 plus 3 times 34. Well, this is already not going good because 3 times 34, that is a very large positive number. That is not even close to being equivalent to 7. So that cannot be the right answer. So the answer is not A. Let's move on to the next one, B. So B, let's just plug in 5 for R again because we've been using R as 5. So 3 times 5 is 15. Um, and then 15 over 2, negative 15 over 2. So negative 15 over 2. It looks like we have we have to add this to 7 over 2. So then we get actually, uh, what is this? Negative, negative 8 over 2, which gives us negative 4. And negative 4, and then our, that's, so that's our x coordinate, and then our y coordinate is just going to be r, right? r we said is 5. And therefore, if we plug this in, will we get the satisfied equation? So we have 2 times x. So x is, oops this so x is going to be negative 4 plus 3 our y value is 5 and i think this is going to be looking good because we have negative 2 times negative 4 is negative 8 yep plus positive 15 is indeed equal to 7 and therefore our answer for that question is going to be b all right so moving on to the questions for practice test 2 uh, this one says, in the xy plane, the graph of the given equation is a circle, so this equation. The length of the radius of the circle is np, where n and p are positive constants. What is the value of n? All right, guys, so this is a very simple problem if you have access to Desmos, right? So in, instead of completing the square um, and all that stuff, all you have to do is really just plug into Desmos. So if we move over here, you can see all I did here is I plugged this equation into Desmos added a slider for the constant p. I just set p equal to 1, but you can have it as any positive constant. And you can see here that the center is negative 7, 4, and you can pretty easily tell the radius from this depiction, right? So you can see the radius here is going to be 3 units. And so if we move back to our question, it said that uh, the length of the radius of the circle is n times p. So n times p is going to be equivalent to the radius, which we said over here was going to be 3. And what do we set p equal to? We set p equal to positive 1, right? So if p is positive 1, then we know 1 times n equals 3. So n must be 3, and therefore 3 is our answer. All right, moving on to question 17 for practice test number 2. This one says, which of the following represents the x-intercept of the graph? of y equals f of x plus 9 in the xy plane where d is a constant. All right, guys, so this is the same deal. All you have to do is know how to use Desmos, right? So the first thing I did over here is you can see I just plugged this equation, the entire thing, right into Desmos, and it plugged it right here, right? We get the x-intercept, but that's not what we want to find. You have to interpret the question. It says, which of the following represents the x-intercept of this uh, f of x plus 9? So there's a transformation. So all we have to do here is after setting the slider for d, which I just said as 1, so it didn't really impact the equation, all you have to do really is just write f of x plus 9, right? That's a transformation they described, and it plotted it right here. This red line right here is going to be that x-intercept. And so you can click on it, and it tells you the exact, exact x-intercept, and so now we know that's going to be negative 1.2667. So go back to your answer choices, and we know we set d equal to 1. So all we have to do here is pretty much just guess and check, right? So we plug in uh, 1 for d in all of our choices, and we see we actually lucky out here. The first choice here is going to be negative 126 times z is 1 minus 26 over 120 will give us that value of uh, negative 1.2667, which lines up with our x-intercept over here. And therefore, we can pretty confidently say that our answer choice all right, guys, so we're going to be moving on to practice test number three, the final two questions. So this one right here is actually the only geometry problem. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting one. So it says in the figure shown, side AD has a value of 121 over 3. And side AB has a value of 11 times square root 130. Oops. 130 over 3. All right. What is the length of DC? So we're trying to find the length of DC over here. 
All right, so the first thing I want to do is we can just use Pythagorean theorem, right? So we have the C squared value over here. We have one of the side lengths. And so we can find the value of the other leg. And so over here, you'll see I've just set up the Pythagorean theorem equation and rearranged it. And we can see that we get a value of 11. And therefore, we have BD is going to have a value of 11. All right, guys, so now what we need to realize is that there is going to be a altitude drawn into this right triangle, right? Right triangle ABC. And therefore, when the altitude is drawn, it creates two similar triangles, all right? And then there's also this thing called the uh, altitude theorem, which basically states that when you have a right triangle, the hypotenuse can be broken up into line segments, and those line segments can be related by a uh, common side, which in our case, the common side is BD because it's been present in both triangles. And we can use that in order to scale up uh, another side to find a missing side length. All right. So I'll show you how it works right here. So the theorem basically states that if you have side one over that common side, that is going to be equivalent to the common side over side two. And in our case, side one, and it also it's important to note that these sides are the sides that make up the length. Uh, the legs, sorry. So it does not include the hypotenuse, right? So what this looks like here is if we bring this down, we have side one, which in our case is going to be side length AD, right? Because that's not the common side and that's the only remaining leg. We can't use the hypotenuse. So you have 121 over three. This is not working. 121 over three over, and the common side is going to be 11. So we just put 11 equals the common side, which is 11. And then the missing side, which is going to be side two. So that missing side will give us the value of DC, right? And you, can, you can actually see right here, I've just used Desmos, right? So I put this uh, expression in to find X. And you can see X aligns with three. And therefore, we can determine that the side length of DC is going to have a value of three. All right, so let's move on to the final problem here. So question 15. Um, so it says in the given equation, P is a positive constant. The sum of the solutions to the equation is 20 over three. What is the value of P? All right, so this is actually a really interesting question that you have to be able to synthesize using Desmos, right? Desmos is your best friend and it is pretty much like a cheat code. So I'll show you how it works. So the first thing I did here recognize without even going to Desmos right here is that 5x squared minus 45. The solution for this is x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. If we're interested in knowing the sum, right, we know that negative 3 and positive 3 are just opposites of each other. And if we did negative 3 plus 3, we get 0. So no matter what, that sum is going to be 0, right? So because the sum here is 0, we're adding 0 no matter what. That is actually irrelevant when we graph it. And so what we did here is just graph the rest of the equation, right? We have 2x squared minus 16x, yada, yada, yada. And so we have a value of P that's a positive constant. And so I just set a random value for P. You can see here I said equal to 2. And what I did is I found the x-intercepts. Now these x-intercepts, right, this one right here and this one right here, these are the x-intercepts of 2x squared minus 16x plus 6p. Now how do I know that? Well, because I know 3x plus p, right? No matter what p is, p has to be a positive constant. And so because p is a positive constant, its x-intercepts are always negative. So here's our example. Let's say like 3x plus, I don't know, like 2. Yeah. So then when I isolate for x, I'm going to get 2 over 3. Negative. Boom. Equals x. And therefore, I know this thing right here, whatever that is, that's always going to be negative, And that is going to be the x-intercept of 3x plus p. And so what I did here is I added I added the x-intercepts, right? Because I'm trying to find the sum. So I add the x-intercepts of 2x squared minus 16x plus 6p. And I get a value of 8. That's very interesting. So I do this again with a different value of p. And I do this again. And you can see the 2x-intercepts here add to a value of 8. All right? And so what happens is the only one that's changing when I change the value of p is going to be 3x plus p, right? So this one right here is going to be changing. And therefore, I can actually set this equal to 20 over 3, right? You have 20 over 3 is our sum. And so if I already have a sum of positive 8 over here, as you can see, this adds to positive 8. 
And therefore, we just subtract it away, positive 8, subtract that away from 20 over 3, and we see that our difference has... All right, so unfortunately, my recording cut out because I have a 15-minute time limit. But anyways, so we know x has to be equivalent to negative 1.333, right? And so that is the other x-intercept value because we know the sum of 2x squared minus 16x plus 6p, no matter what p is, that sum of those x-intercepts is going to be positive 8. And we know that the limit or the sum right here has to be 20 over 3. And so because we got x equals negative 1.333, now we have to observe that 3x plus p, right? So the value you want to get right here is negative 1, 1 third. And so if you look at 3x plus p, like we said before, no matter what p is, because it is a positive constant, this x-intercept is going to be negative. So we just have to have a value of p here that will give us a value of x that is negative 1, 1 third, right? And that's pretty simple here because if we just set 3x plus 4 equals 0, we can see here that when we isolate for x, we'll just get negative 4 because subtract negative 4 on both sides and then divide both sides by 3 and we get x equals negative 4 over 3, which is the same thing as negative 1, 1 third. And so our answer for this problem is because we set p equal to positive 4, and that doesn't affect the x-intercepts of 2x squared minus 16x, I think you get the idea. So we have positive 4 over there, and the for positive 4 is our value of p. So yeah, guys, that does it for the video here. I hope you guys learned something. Um, if you take away one thing from this video is that you have to learn how to use Desimus. It is going to save you so much time and a lot of headaches when you actually take this. Uh, once again, big shout out to JW Math Tutoring. Make sure you check out his channel below as well as the original PDF. I hope you guys learned something today and thank you for watching.